Well, good morning. Uh, go ahead, take out your Bibles, turn to the book of Mark. Uh, we have been walking through the Gospel of Mark, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We're in chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 12 in just a moment. I do want to say Happy Father's Day. I'll pray over our fathers in just a moment. Uh, but we do have, uh, as we're just walking through the Gospel of Mark, we have a difficult topic to talk about on Father's Day. Uh, we talked about on Mother's Day another difficult topic. This is just the way that they sovereignly fell. Uh, but I think we talked about hell on Mother's Day, and we're talking about hip- hypocrisy on Father's Day. Um, there's a dad joke somewhere in there about motherhood and fatherhood and those two terms. But um, we do have a difficult topic uh, to address in Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 12. Um, Hypocrisy is something that every single one of us deals with. It's something that we all struggle with. We've all struggled with seeing it in others. We've struggled with reconciling truth with what we see of people who proclaim it. It's something that we constantly struggle with in our own lives and in the lives of others. Uh, I think to best kind of sum up the feeling, it would be something like this. Hypocrisy is so hard. We know that it's wrong. It's something that we don't want to be called or worse yet, be. Yet at the same time, we all want to be perceived as something that we know we are not. Huh. What a difficult place to find authenticity. Hypocrisy. I hate it and you hate it too. So why do we become so content to simply preach? Waking up every morning, dressing to hide our flaws while pressing to discover the flaws of others around us. Caught in this circle of seeking truth, even truth about ourselves, only to hide more of what we find. Tending to present only what is presentable and to present of others what we want no one else to know of ourselves. Judging and poking at insecurities. This makes me feel better about being fake. But truth of self never seems to actually set me or those around me free. No, the truth that we know of ourselves without something, someone to save us, change us, doesn't bring liberty. It brings further captivity, hypocrisy. We all want to be free of it, to live in truth inside and out, free of hiding, free to love, free to preach truth, free to say, watch me live it out. It seems so simple. I am what I am, but if I live that out, who would I be? It seems my own natural belief leaves me with no option. I am not what I believe. Hypocrisy isn't my best option. To desire to be perceived as something that I'm not, deception, it can't be. Save me from this. Something make me new. Free me to know and live in truth, even if what I am has to die for something authentic to be born. God, thank you so much for your word this morning and the opportunity to dive into it and and to wrestle with and deal with this topic that every single one of us struggles with and none of us desires it. None of us wants to be something that we don't perceive ourselves to be. None of us want to have interactions and community with unauthenticity. And and, and God, we desire to authentically be ourselves and live that out in everything that we do. Help us to know this morning That only in you can we be set free to live authentically, to have an identity that matches our activity. Because everything else, Father, we know that we will be striving to build something in us that we are not. We will never be able to be authentically who we are on the inside and live it out on the outside because we're constantly trying to gain something on the outside to build the inside. Help us to authentically know who we were created to be in you so that we might authentically live in truth. And God, we know it won't be perfect, but help us to pursue you. Help us to reveal love. Help us to pursue forgiveness. God, help us to live genuinely as you've created us to. And I do lift up all of the fathers. God, I do believe that you have called us to this passage at this time. I believe that fathers are called to lead well and being genuinely for your glory. I do lift up those that that may not have had a father in life that pointed them towards you or a father that wasn't there for them. God, I lift up those who maybe find heartache during this time of year because they've lost a father. And God, I'm thankful that we can look to you as the ultimate father who is good in all things 
and ultimately who our fathers are supposed to point to. And so we do not have to miss out on the ultimate father who loves, sustains, and guides and brings us into community with him. And so God, as we open your word this morning, would you just bless your word? Would you speak to us in a living and active way? Would you directly uh, just probe our hearts where we need so that we might be completely centered around you in all things and as a church body, not only individually, but that we would live out the truths of who you call us to be. And so in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, so as we look at this text this morning, and we're going to jump right into it because we have a, a, a lot of verses to look at, but as we look at this, we know what we're looking at is this idea of knowing and being. Everything that we long to be and pursue, uh, pursue to be, um, and Jesus really begins to teach us about this concept in our text this morning, but it's in one of the most unlikely of, of ways. It's not really something we would expect for him to teach this through. So look with me, Matthew, or Mark rather, chapter 11, starting in verse 12. And on the following day, when they came to Bethany, this is Jesus and the disciples and those following, he was hungry and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was out of season for figs. And he said, it may, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And so this is the first odd thing that seems really out of character from Jesus. It's the first and only destructive miracle in the New Testament that Jesus performs. So something strange is happening. It's a reason that a lot of scholars have looked at God's word and thought Jesus can't be who he says he is. And he can't have done what he says he would come to do because God wouldn't do that. He wouldn't just curse a fig tree for no reason. And we may find that a little bit silly, but it's actually been a dominant reason in this text for not believing Jesus is who he says he is. So something different's happening here. This is the first thing that seems a little out of Jesus's character when he's talking about a genuine, authentic faith. But then look in verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem and entered into the temple, and he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of money changers and seats of those who sold pigeons, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers." And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all of the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. And as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away at its roots. And Peter remembered and said, and Peter often just plays Captain Obvious in the Gospels, right? Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. And Jesus is pointing to something directly. A, a, most scholars believe a temple mount. There's a direct application to the temple being torn down and, the, and not a stone on itself and thrown into, if you remember, if we've gone through the book of Mark, the sea is, is considered in the first century by Jewish people and Gentiles to be the depths of darkness. And so the temple will be torn, thrown into the depths of darkness. Why? Because of what we see here. What will rise, Christ will rise from the dead and the temple will be made new and the veil will be torn and we will have access to the father restored in community with him and this beautiful authentic identity will be made available but then there's also an application to us through prayer and we'll see that verse 24 therefore I tell you whatever you ask in prayer believe that you have and you have received it and it will be yours and whenever you stand praying forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. So as we look at this text, we see these two things that seem out of character for Jesus. Uh, the first one we talked about in red is that Jesus curses a fig tree. The second one is he goes into the temple and Jesus has been in synagogues. He's been to the temple. Uh, he's been in 35 different, as we talked about last week, towns, cities, villages, uh, at least. 
where he's gone into synagogues, preaching, teaching, all the same things are happening there. But here he goes into the temple and just starts turning tables. And it can look like Jesus has lost his mind. Jesus has gotten really angry. He's just fed up and sick of it. He's getting close to the cross and he's scared. It could look like a whole bunch of other things are happening. So we need to be able to dig in and see what is actually going on here. And we've got a lot of text because Mark will do something that that scholars call making sandwiches. They're Markian sandwiches. And so he'll kind of take a story uh, as like a slice of bread and then he'll give some meat to it and then he'll bring it back together with the other slice of bread. And you need all three parts to make a meal. Um, And so there's the point that he's trying to make and we need all of it. So we've got to go through all of this text and we could take each one and give it weeks uh, each passage. Uh, We really could, but we'll put them all together this morning so we can see the full story. And this is what Mark wants us to begin to understand. And it might seem a little bit weird to us that Jesus curses something. It's out of character. He's, He's tipping tables. What is actually taking place? Well, if you remember last week, we talked about how Jesus in all of his life was headed towards, he's been proclaiming and teaching that he is the Messiah, that he is God. He has come in the flesh to live for us because we were created to know God and have communion with him, but walked away in rebellion. And Jesus came to live the life that we can't live, to give glory and honor to the Father in all things, and then pay the penalty of our sin by going to the cross and rising from the grave to defeat all that's defeating us so that we might be restored in communion with him. Our sin, rebellion might be paid for and purchased. And by his grace through faith, we might have an authentic identity that we were created and designed to have. Jesus has been proclaiming this. He's been revealing his power and who he is through his miraculous works in all All of it has been his moving towards Jerusalem where he would die on the cross. And we talked last week about how it's not just about Jesus moving towards Jerusalem. It's ultimately him going into Jerusalem because that's where the temple is. And last week we saw how Jesus comes in on this procession like a wedding. He rides in on a donkey to reveal peace and he's coming to restore and bring salvation to his people. And and on a much deeper level than just setting up this physical kingdom. But as he comes in and everybody is laying palm branches down and their cloaks down, what would typically happen in this case, if this was truly a king and a ruler who was going to rise his people out of oppression and build a physical kingdom for them to reign and rule over their enemies, then the king ruler would march into town and he would go to the temple and the priests and religious leaders would follow and all the people would come behind. And at the temple, almost like a coronation, the priests would bless the ruler. But in Jesus's case, he comes in not riding on a horse to show that he's going to war and he's going to bring victory in a physical sense, but coming in peace, though he will one day return on a white horse to make all things new. And there's symbolism there that we need to understand in the first century. But this time he comes on a donkey to bring peace, to restore salvation to make us new, to set up his kingdom that is eternal and not just physical that will rise and fall. And everything seems normal. He comes into town and here he comes and people are laying their cloaks and palm branches down. But when he gets to the priests and the religious leaders, they don't follow him, but they call him out. And they say, how dare you begin to call yourself these things and allow people to call you these things. Only God can be these things and be called these things. And, and Jesus has this interaction with them in the book of Luke where he says, if these people did not cry out, then the rocks would have cried out. And I think even that little part is important for us to understand something with the fig tree today. That all of creation has been groaning and longing, Romans 1 says, since sin entered the world and brokenness separated men from having dominion over the earth and giving glory with all things that God had created to him with his creation and having community with God as humanity. And since that time, not only have we been longing and seeking for a savior to restore true authentic identity, but the earth around us has longed for us to use it to give worship to God and not to worship it. And Jesus walks in and the priests call him out. And Jesus has this moment where they don't follow him to the temple, but he goes to the temple alone. 
And he stands there amongst all of the lambs in the court of the Gentiles where Josephus, a a historian, tells us over 255,000 lambs would be sold in any given Passover week. And he knows that he is the lamb, the lamb that would lay his life down to bring salvation to all who would place their faith in him. And then he goes back into Bethany on the Mount of Olives. And this is symbolic of him bringing God back into the city. If you remember the the Ezekiel passage that we looked at last week, where Ezekiel had this vision from God that because the Israelite people were not worshiping him and using the temple to reveal him and to grow in him and to reveal him to the nations, God's presence leaves the temple, goes through the east gate and rests on the Mount of Olives. And here comes Jesus on the Mount of Olives through the east gate on his processional to the temple where the presence of God will be restored with all who place their faith in him. And so Jesus then goes back up to Bethany. He's on the Mount of Olives. And, and the next day, he's going to begin to walk down. But he's a, he knows he's in the last week of his life. He's going to the cross He's going to rise from the dead. He's going to ascend back into his rightful place. He's going to send the spirit to live and dwell in all of those who place their faith in him. And the church will begin to explode. But here's what the church and the disciples need to know. What does authentic faith actually look like? Can we just look at the temple and what's happening in the temple and in worship and in the church? And and is that authentic faith? Is that us living out our true identities and mission? And this text is how Jesus is going to reveal that to us. It's in the most odd of ways. I don't know that this is how I would do this, but this is how the God of the universe reveals this. And so Jesus wakes up that next morning and he begins to walk with his disciples and those who are following him back into Jerusalem from Bethany in the Mount of Olives. It's a short distance. And it says Jesus was hungry. He didn't have time for breakfast or whatever it was, or he just has a lesson for the disciples. And so he's hungry. And in the distance, he sees a fig tree. In the distance, he sees this fig tree that's full of leaves. And that's important for us to see and to understand what's happening there. This fig tree from a distance looks good. And it looks like it will provide. And it looks like it has life. And it looks like it will fulfill his hunger and his desire and his need. But when he and the others get over to this fig tree, there's actually no fruit on it at all. It doesn't have any life at all. It has these beautiful leaves and it looks like it's life-giving from a distance. But when Jesus gets close, there's actually no fruit on it. There's no life to be found there. And it it gives us the reason. I love how Mark throws this in there because if we know anything about fig trees, and this is an agrarian culture, so they would understand fig trees and other things. They were everywhere in Jerusalem in the first century. Many were growing them purposely, but they were also just sprouting up everywhere. And, And everyone would know that it's not in season, that figs come in the fall, and this is more in the spring. So yeah, stands to reason, Jesus, like we're going to come over to this fig tree and there's not going to be any figs there because this isn't the time of year that figs really reveal themselves. Seems obvious. But the disciples, something's happening here because the disciples, they're, they're, they're kind of like, I don't really understand what just happened, but they, they don't really cause a fuss about what happens when Jesus curses the tree. They, they understand something that we need some insight on because they hear Jesus curse the tree. Peter's going to bring it up later, but they don't ask a question then. It's almost like it's a normal thing that Jesus would, would do this or expect something from the tree, even though it's out of season for it. They're confused. But, but they don't seem like this is odd. And so what's happening here that would cause Jesus to do this? What's he trying to show us? What do the disciples understand that we don't? And, and what we need to understand, again, as I said, is this is a text that I want us to have a little bit of, of history and understanding on because so many people have used it to say, if Jesus were to do this, there, there's no way that he could be who he says he is. And part of that reason is because in our culture today, the only things that are okay to worship are really nature and self. Um, And so when Jesus curses curses a fig tree, that's not okay with many of us. Um, And then otherwise, there's also a lot of scholars that have pointed this thing out. Bertrand Russell is one, um, but not the least of. 
But in his essay, Why Am I Not a Christian? He's an atheist who did a lot of writing on Christianity and why it's not true. He singles this act out as one of the single acts that he would say, Jesus can't be God. And he says the the fact that someone would do this would make them not even a good man, let alone a God man. This situation displays, he said, that Jesus as a man was vindictive and he had fury that was uncalled for on this innocent plant, something that God would not do. And so just a couple of things to point out there. You might not be struggling with the reality that Jesus curses a fig tree at all. That's fine. If you grew up in the church, this is just a story that you know, you haven't really thought that much about it. But maybe you think to yourself, what would I say if somebody brought this kind of thing up? So just really quickly so that we have an understanding here. First, I want us to know that God created the fig tree. I just pointed out that as Jesus walks into the city and people are laying cloaks down and the priests call him out, Jesus says to the priests in the book of Luke that if these people did not cry out, the rocks would cry out. And, we, and I talked about Romans 1 and how the earth is groaning for God to restore into what he created it to be. And, and so the first thing that I just want to point out is if he has God, is God, and he created all things and all things he created for his glory, then all things long for his glory to be known. And this tree, if it even was able to think in this way, would be more than willing to give his life to make the point Jesus is making. Secondly, I just want to point out that when Jesus does this, he is making an example of this so that we can understand something that's taking place that we need to understand as the church and as his people. So he's certainly doing something that We don't really understand, but we need to ask the question, why? Because yes, on the surface, it looks like Jesus just got really excited about food and then got really mad and said, wither and die when no food was there. But while it's true that the fig tree was out of season, there is something people in the city would understand. And it's what we need to know as well. Yes, figs come in the fall, but... As I said, many people would grow them, but fig trees would also grow all over the city. And in so happening, many different species of fig trees were in existence in the first century. And many of these trees would spring forth with leaves in the springtime. And they would have these nodules on them that were good for eating. And these nodules that would come were the precursor to the figs that would be produced later in the year by these trees. And there were a lot of different species that were actually spring forth early. And then they would have these nodules on them and you would be able to go and partake in them and eat in them. And they're not as good as the figs, but they could certainly be something that would be there to snack on. And so it seems that this is what Jesus believes. This is a early sprouting fig from a distance. It looks really good. It should have these nodules that are going to turn into figs and I can eat them. This is what Jesus is most likely likely thinking. Here's this tree. It looks good. Let's go over to it. It's full of leaves. It's got foliage all over it. But if In reality, there are not these nodules on even a tree that's full of leaves. Then people in the first century in this agrarian culture would understand that it is actually in decay. It's not going to produce figs because the precursors to the figs aren't there. So there might be these big trees that would go 20 feet tall and 20 feet wide. They might have greenery all over them. But if the precursor to the figs aren't there then even though it has grown and is growing, it is actually in decay. It's just a matter of time before it withers and it dies. And so here's what Jesus is doing. And he's giving us kind of this living parable, if you will. It's an object lesson or an object um, kind of prophecy for us to see and to understand, which Old Testament prophets would often do. They would give an object lesson that would point to something in reality, and they would kind of set it up with something that really happens and then reveal it with the Israelite people, in this place, the people of God and the temple. And so Jesus is giving us this object lesson or living parable. 
But that still doesn't answer the question. If Jesus is walking up to this tree, it looks really good, but it doesn't have the precursor to the figs. It makes sense. It's, it's decaying and it's dying. So Jesus isn't going to have his hunger satisfied. The tree isn't really what it looks like it is. But why does he curse it? Why doesn't he just walk away disappointed? We'll just catch something when we get into Jerusalem. I'll feed myself there. Well, here's the thing. Jesus is not just coming as the Messiah, though he is, to live for us, to die, to rise, to bring life and restore authentic identity so that we can live out who we truly are, where we live and where we work and where we play in all things of life, giving worship to him with everything that he has created. But he is also a prophet. And he is pointing towards and making promises of what he will do in the future all throughout his life. And here he gives this prophecy of what's to come, of the people of God and the temple. It's a warning for us today. It's something that we need to pay attention to. And this was really common, as I said, in the Old Testament. And it's exactly what Jesus does here. In effect... Jesus is saying, this tree is revealing something that it truly is not. It's giving representation of something that it is not on the inside. It looks like life and it looks like fulfillment, but it's actually in decay and it's leading to death. So that the object lesson or the living parable to what Jesus is about to reveal in the temple is that when we come together and worship God, there is a way in which we can look at the leaves and we can think it's beautiful and it's life-giving and it's active and it has, it has religious activity and things are happening and, and it looks from a distance like we can find true and authentic life within it. But when we get close... There's no fruit. And so Jesus does this object lesson to the tree. And the disciples, are, they hear it, but they're confused. They're just kind of like, okay, well, that was kind of weird. Let's just continue on into Jerusalem. And, and that's the first piece of bread that Mark gives us. He's setting up this whole meal for us to understand. So look in verse 15. They head into the temple and we need to know a little bit about the temple. So now we know the backstory for what Jesus is about to walk into and show us. There's something Jesus needs us to understand about authentic faith and what we can fall into. But then we need to understand the temple. What is Jesus actually walking into? What is he about to overturn tables in? And, and the temple, just really quickly, you can study this on your own. We have time to really dig in this morning. But I want us to have a, a basic understanding. The temple really has technically five parts to it. Uh, there's the court of the Gentiles. That is the outer portion of the temple. It's the largest portion of the temple. And this is where the Gentiles can go in and worship. And so Gentiles were supposed to be able to go into this outer court. And they were supposed to be able to seek the presence of God. They were supposed to be able to learn about God, pray to God, worship God. This is what the outer temple is set up and designed to be. This is what God has declared it to be. Then you would have the court of the Jewish women, and they were able to go one step inside of what the Gentiles were able to do. And they were able to worship and to seek God in the presence of God there. Then you had the court of the Jewish men. Inside of that, you would have the court of the priests, which only priests could go into. And then you would have the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was only gone into one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And it was to represent the presence of God with his people on earth. And on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go behind a curtain, a veil that would keep everyone out and everything in. And he would go around the curtain or the veil and he would make sacrifice for the people pointing towards the Messiah that would come and would ultimately one day be the sacrificial lamb. So this is how the, court, the temple courts are set up. And the, the temple was huge. It covered about 35 acres in whole. And so you have this massive part of Jerusalem, just the temple. It's taking up a huge part of the city. And the idea behind the temple is also important. It goes all the way back, as we know, to the Old Testament. And we understand, and if you've grown up in church, you know this, but we understand that God created, and we've already mentioned it here this morning, that God created us in a garden to have community with him. 
to give him glory in all things, to know who we are, to be able to live it out, to be connected with him, to understand how we connect to his creation, to give worship to him in everything. But because of our rebellion and sin, our desire to use what he has created for our own kingdoms and our own good and to rule over ourselves, sin enters into humanity and we are cast out of the presence of God. We're cast out of his presence because he is holy and perfect and no sin and rebellion can be in community with him. And it's not good enough for us to say, sorry, we shouldn't have done that because now we are marked by brokenness and sin. And that sin has to be paid for, to be brought back into community with God. It has to be somehow forgiven. And the question becomes, how will justice on our sin come? Are we stuck in this this way of separation from God and authentic self and true identity for all of eternity and humanity? Or will there be a way for us to be restored? And this is the, the reason for all of the injustices we see. All of us look at the world around us and we see things that shouldn't be the way that they are. Ultimately, what's underneath all of that is sin and brokenness. That is what is the ultimate injustice. And it just bears fruit of death in everything in our lives, in communities, and the way we view the world, and then the way we try to pursue things and achieve things. And it separates who we are from how we live. It, it causes us to find distress in who we are and how we present ourselves. This is what sin does. And so in Genesis 3.15, God in his love and his mercy makes a promise that the Messiah will come and one day pay for the penalty of our sin, perfectly living on our behalf and then taking our place, paying the ransom for our sinfulness and brokenness. And then we might be brought back into community with him by his grace and to set up the Messiah, he calls for himself the Israelite people. And the Israelite people are to reveal what it's like to worship God and to live with with his kingdom is what we try to reveal and to seek. And obviously, all throughout the Old Testament, the Israelite people struggle. They're worshiping other gods. They're prone to sinfulness and brokenness, just like we are. And the temple was set up to represent the presence of God amongst his people in the Old Testament. This is where they would go to worship and to be near him. And the sacrificial system was set up so that they could uh, point themselves to the reality that God himself must forgive sin and he must make a way. And, and the whole sacrificial system is set up to show us the seriousness of sin and what God must do to forgive us of our sin. And the temple reveals his presence and we can come to the temple and be in the presence of God in a sinful world. But there's a veil between us that must be torn and only God can tear it apart and allow us to have community with him. This is why we're looking towards the Messiah, but this is why the temple in the Old Testament is so beautiful. Today, we might look at something like the temple and think, yeah, it's just another church. It's just a building. But that's because we understand the theology of scripture that Jesus has come. He has lived. He has died. He has risen. The the veil of the temple has been torn because he paid for the penalty of our sin. And now by his grace through faith, we can be in community with him again restored. And we don't have to go to a place to be in his presence. But we are the temple. He lives and dwells in us. And everywhere we go, the temple goes with us. The presence of God. But in the Old Testament, the temple represented the presence of God. It's access to him. It's to be in the presence of our creator, to experience his kingdom, to worship him, to learn of him, to be dependent upon him, to pray with him, to build community around him, to repent and look towards his coming. The temple to the Israelite people was everything. It was their identity. If you take that away, they have nothing. It is who they are, and what happens in the temple represents who they are. This is what Jesus is walking into. 
So he gives us this object lesson uh, of this tree that looks so beautiful, but when you get close, there's no fruit, there's no life. And now he's walking into the temple, which represents the life of his people and the presence of God and revealing him to the nations, his kingdom that we long for. It's supposed to be the place of authentic identity where we are and we live it out. And we know we don't do so perfectly, but we're pursuing him as he's transforming our hearts. This is what he's supposed to walk into, the presence of God. But Jesus walks into the Gentile court, and it is full of people. From a distance, it would look like, man, all this religious activity is happening. And man, there's thousands and thousands of people in the Gentile court. This is incredible. Look what the church is doing. They're they're making sacrifices to God for their sin. And and they're willing to sacrifice their money to pay for these sacrifices. Look what they're doing. They're so religious. They're so spiritual. Like everything about the temple from a distance looks life-giving. Look at the leaves. But when Jesus walks in, what he finds is money changers and vendors. It's the Passover week. And so we talked last week about how the city of Jerusalem would swell to five to ten times its normal population. All of these people are traveling from all over the place to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And so they're bringing with them money that isn't used in Jerusalem that needs to be exchanged. And they're not typically traveling with the lambs or whatever it would be that they would sacrifice. And so they go to the temple to exchange their money and to purchase a lamb. And what would be happening with these hundreds of vendors is that when you would come in to exchange the money, tariffs would be added to the exchange rate. And so the temple is making money off of you and you're getting a poor exchange rate and then you're turning right around and you're paying for a lamb at a premium price. Much greater price than you would ever pay in any other situation. So there's extortion that's happening in the temple. The temple is chaos. In effect, the people who are leading the temple are not ushering people into the presence of God. They're not praying. They're not revealing him. They're not worshiping. They're not studying his word, but they're trying to build their own kingdom. They're trying to say, here's what we need to build the kingdom that we long for. And so what we're going to do is use the people that come in to get what we want, not reveal to them the kingdom of God so that they can have the joy and experience the life that God created them to know and experience. In effect, they're worshiping the leaves, the things of life that look good and look satisfying and look like they'll give us what we long for, but don't actually bear the fruit of joy. They're building their own kingdom. This is what's taking place in the temple. It's a false gospel with false worship to false gods. Not only that, but people are actually using the temple, the Gentile court, to walk through. So they're coming in, traveling from all over the place. They've got all of this stuff with them. And they're going, nah, the temple's too big to walk around. The Gentile court doesn't really matter. Who cares about them? Hopefully when the Messiah comes, he's just going to push the Gentiles out anyways. And this is what they believed, that God, when he came, would push the Gentiles out completely. In fact, if you were to go from the Gentile court to the court of the women, there would be signs up, plaques that would say, any Gentile that goes past this point, your life is being taken into your own hands. So they believe the Gentiles, who cares about them? We'll do business, we'll make money, we'll use people. And then people are just traveling right through the temple. No reverence for God, no fear for him, no worship at all. And this is the place the presence of God is supposed to be come to, to come into the presence of. And this is the only place that the Gentiles in all of the world could come into the presence of God and learn of his word and hear of his truth and worship and depend on him. And it's being completely used for other things. And so remember the object lesson that Jesus had just shown and then compare that to what's taking place in the temple. And then in Jesus' righteous anger, he starts turning over tables You can just imagine people kind of running over to him like, what are you doing? And they're just, they are offended at their offending of God. And we do this all the time in our lives. We get really offended at wrong things we do, right? 
Um, I experience this with all the time with people. It's like they did something they probably shouldn't have done. And I say, hey, can we like work this out? And it's like they're offended that I'm actually saying they did something that <laughs> offended me, right? It's like, this is just the way we work. We all do it. They do this with Jesus as well. And so Jesus comes and just starts turning the tables, yelling the truth of the gospel. And here's how I need us to see this. This is actually Jesus coming to set the captive free, not some sort of weird anger that God in the human form should not reveal if he truly is who he says he is. No, this is the kind of anger that is righteous, that if Jesus is who he says he is, this is the only way for him to respond to what is happening. When he comes in and turns the tables, here's how I need you to think about this. It would be like us storming into a house where people are being trafficked and there's human trafficking taking place. And we go into the house and we start just destructing property and and cutting chains and pulling apart cages that people are in, all in the name of breaking people loose of oppression and setting people free from their captivity. This is what Jesus is doing. He's coming into the temple and he's righteously angry and he's breaking and turning over tables and, and turning over vendors because he's going, this is oppression. This is shackling people. This is putting people in cages. This is worshiping false gods. This will not bring genuine identity. This will not lead you to authenticity. This is enslaving. And he comes in to set us free because the only thing that sets us free is knowing who he is and worshiping and giving glory to him. Do not make his temple a house of thieves and a, and a place for robbers. This is a place for the presence of God. This is why he turns the tables over to set people free. This is why he quotes Isaiah 56, 6 and 7. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And you're actually doing things that are keeping the nations out. And you're not coming to me, but you're trying to build your own kingdoms. This is what Jesus is doing. In Malachi 3, he tells us that Jesus will come into the temple and he will have no tolerance for hollow worship and hypocrisy. For those who miss it, for those who just take part of religious activity, for those who don't love and reveal truth to people all around them, to those who don't have open arms to all people, that they might reveal to them the love of Jesus and what actually sets the captive free. But it, we are either setting people free with the truth of Jesus or we in, are enslaving them to the things of the world. And God says, I do not tolerate those who say they believe but who are not transformed. They claim to represent me, but there's no fruit there. He's warning the Israelite people. He's warning the disciples. He's warning us today, the church. Don't be lukewarm. Don't be hypocritical. And that's not to say that we're going to be perfect. We understand that. But we're in pursuit of God's holiness and revealing him. But he says, don't, don't say that you love God and, and live in all of, the, of his law, but not actually have a heart that's transformed, that's revealing his love. That's like the rich young ruler who says, I've done all of these things. And God says, yeah, go and give it all away. Surrender it all to me. Heart transformation that bears the fruit of the spirit. And listen, here's what Jesus is saying. The church might look like it's green. But if it's not bearing the fruit of the Spirit in the gospel truth of love, joy, peace, kindness, fulfillment, then it's in decay. It's actually leading unto death. And as I was thinking about this week, I I was just thinking to myself how easy it is for us to find ourselves there. How much we need to ask ourselves the question in our own hearts, does this describe us? Does this describe the church of today? I'm here singing. I'm, I'm hearing and receiving the word. I'm, I'm healthy. I'm, I'm studying God's word. I'm going to him in prayer. I'm, I'm going to the church. Look at the leaves. Look at the leaves of my life. And, and anybody can look at me and go, look, he's, he's living. She's living the right way. She's doing the right thing. She, she loves Jesus. He, he loves God. But if there is no transformation, if there is no fruit, then you are not authentic. There's no life. This is where Jerusalem was. This is where the temple was. 
And if we're not careful, we can be just like the temple in Jerusalem. There's a trend right now in the American church not to exchange money and lambs at a premium, but to create spaces where everything is done for the comfort of the Christian. We will quietly find ways by comforting ourselves to keep those who need Jesus most out. Or at least seek ways to reveal Jesus that are most desirable to us and by default not allowing all people to see the truth of Christ revealed. And we might not give uh, we might give to the city and to missions, and, and certainly the church is all about those things, but, but we're content as the people of God just to be a part of an organization that does the things of God and reveals the heart of God so that we don't actually have to participate in doing any of the things that God calls us to where we live, where we work, and where we play. See, we need to ask ourselves the question, is there real surrender and devotion to God? Is there true mission? Is my identity actually matching the way that I live? Or am I worshiping other gods and am I seeking other things? What would Jesus do if he walked into the identity of my life? Out of love, would he turn some tables? What tables would be in the way of complete surrender to him? And and I know you might be thinking, Brandon, it's Father's Day. Why are you getting into, I know that. And and as I said at the beginning, fathers need to hear a difficult word. We need to ask ourselves, how are we leading our families? Are we bearing fruit? Are we pointing them to the glory of God in everything that we do? See, one of the top objections to Christianity, we would think in our culture of this idea of logic and reasoning and science that we would have all these logical reasons for why God can't exist. And and ultimately, what it all boils down to is, he's not the God that I want, as we talked to about in the book of Mark. But what we see time and time again as these studies continue to play out, is he's not the God that I want, and I can't find anybody that's revealing the God that he says he is to be better than the one that I want. Because time and time again, hypocrisy is at the top of the list of why people see Christians and then don't believe in God. Now, I am not saying, listen to me, I'm not saying that if you are not a believer and you see a hypocritical Christian, that's a good enough reason for you to deny truth. It is terrible for you to deny truth based on somebody who says they believe it but don't live it out. Bad reason to deny him. But we do need to, as believers... Understand that when we truly know who we are in Jesus, it will be being revealed. And we are called to reveal the goodness of Jesus in everything that we do, in everything that we are, with everything that we have. And we know we don't do so perfectly. That's why Jesus ends the text the way that he does. But I love how R.C. Spohl said it. He once said that the church is the only organization on earth that requires that we know that we are sinners before we can join. So yes, we don't do things perfectly, but we want to reveal Jesus in everything that we do. This is what we ultimately desire. And when we place our faith in Christ and we truly surrender ourselves to him, the fruit of the Spirit will begin to be revealed. Jesus will begin to work in us. We will desire to worship him and reveal him more and more. This is what we want. And this is what the world needs to see. So ask yourself, is this... What describes me? Am I living a life just to reveal the leaves in hopes that everybody will see me as what I want them to see me as? Or am I bearing the fruit of God and revealing life in his kingdom? This is the application to this text. I'll close with this. There's just two things Jesus says that I'll just point out really quickly. He says, these are the things that reveal if my life is in Christ. He he says, the first thing is, we'll be dependent upon him in prayer. Here's what I want you to know. If you know who God is and you understand your relationship to him, you will depend on him in everything and you will go to him in prayer first with him at the center of everything. And here is a true statement. I don't know who said it or I would give credit, but it is beautiful. If we are not prayerful, then we will be prideful. If we are not a people defined by dependence upon God, going to him in prayer for all things, then we are depending upon ourselves and you will never be the authentic self that you were created to be. 
Maybe you're like, I pray all the time. Well, investigate and examine the way that you pray. If you had everything that you prayed for, if God gave you everything you prayed for today, what would you have? Would you have a whole bunch of things that make your kingdom better? Or would his kingdom be more revealed in your marriage? Would his kingdom be more revealed in this church? Would his kingdom be more revealed in this city? Would it be more revealed in our nation? What would be the outcome? Where is our heart? Are we totally dependent upon him? Bearing fruit. Are we seeking him in all things? And he shows this by this hyperbolic statement. He's not saying to us that everything we pray, if we have enough faith, we will get it. What he's saying is he's modeling the Lord's prayer. If you go back to Matthew chapter 6, you'll see that the Lord's prayer goes up in glory. Then it goes down to reveal his kingdom, in to pray for my own heart, and then out to pray for his mission. And he says, when we model and pray in this way, when we're seeking him in all things at the center, all things are possible with God. And in faith, when we seek him above all things, his will will be done in our lives. Secondly, that was the inward portion. The outward portion is the last thing that I'll say this morning, that in him, if we truly understand who we are in, in him, Either we will be loving and forgiving or we will be hypocritical. The way that we reveal grace will reveal how much we understand the grace that's been given to us. I love how Mark says it. Forgive anything against anyone. That, that pretty much sums it up. Is it anything? Is it anyone? You've been forgiven more. Reveal grace, forgive. It doesn't mean that there'll be reconciliation in every relationship that we struggle with on this earth until Christ returns and makes all things new. But follow Matthew 18. Seek to forgive, seek to love, seek to show grace. These are the activities. I'm depending on him in all things in prayer and, and, I'm, and I'm loving and I'm showing grace and I'm forgiving in all relationships that I have. This begins to reveal. See, the gospel is the only antidote to hypocrisy. It's the only thing that gives true authenticity. I am because of Jesus. Therefore, I can live out who I am because of his grace.